Very welcome, everyone, uh, to the Microstructure Exchange. So today we have uh, Kumar uh, Venkataraman uh, from SMU uh, to present uh, this uh, paper, Receiving Investors in the Block Market for Corporate Bonds. Uh, Stacy Jacobson, uh, who's the co-author, uh, is also here and uh, very happy to have both of you. And uh, Stacy will be in the chat uh, if, in case you have clarification questions. And uh, Kumar has um, asked us to uh, hold the questions for the first 15 minutes uh, so until he fi has finished the introduction. And uh, after that uh, question break, uh, we can uh, uh, just raise hand uh, any time during the presentation and, uh, uh, to ask our questions. Uh, I, I think that's uh, all. Uh, so Kumar, Take it away. Thank you. Uh, many thanks to the conference organizers. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar faces, old friends. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, so this is a paper with uh, uh, Stacy uh, Jacobson, where we are looking at the uh, block market for uh, corporate bonds. So I would like to uh, take the first 15 minutes to just talk about, you know, what is this paper about? What is our approach? And a quick summary of findings. And at that point in time, um, certainly open to any questions that you have. And then I'll proceed with providing some more information on the data and the sample, uh, the price effects of these block trades, and the impact of adverse selection and uh, trade reporting rules on the block market. And then finally conclude with some discussion of the implications for some recent uh, regulatory discussions on, on, uh, uh, on uh, trade reporting. So, uh, so we look at the corporate bond uh, uh, trace data, and uh, the first uh, first result that we have is that the block market is an important source of uh, liquidity for institutional investors. So, uh, what is a block trade? So, we look at uh, twenty years of data, two thousand two to twenty twenty one. And um, we have uh, several definitions of block trades, but the one that uh, we use uh, for most of the paper is when the customer trade is uh, $15 million or more. So this is a single trade between a dealer and a customer that exceeds $15 million. So the average trade size uh, in our sample of this, uh, of this block trade is uh, $22 million. And <clears throat> if you look at the time series here from uh, 2002 to 2021, uh, based on this $15 million, uh, you'll see that this represents about 13% uh, of the uh, trace reported trading volume. And uh, this has been fairly stable uh, over the last decade or so. And if you have other definitions, such as uh, if you use 20 million as the uh, block trade size or 30 million as a block trade size, you can still see that uh, the, uh, the uh, market share remains fairly stable. So, uh, sort of having established that this is an important um, part of the market, which continues to be important today, um, we, then, uh, we then go on and um, test some of the theoretical uh, predictions of, that come from the uh, block, block trading literature. So in the theoretical models, there are uh, three participants. You have the block initiator, um, you have a dealer, and you have the participants to whom the dealer distributes this block position, who we call receiving investors in the paper. So uh, the block initiator approaches the dealer. And uh, in these models, the dealer uh, participates in a principal capacity by taking on the block position. And then the dealer distributes uh, the block position uh, to, the, uh, to the receiving investors. And uh, so here are some of the uh, um, important models in, in this setting, and there are many more uh, of these theoretical models that, uh, that I will also reference uh, later in the presentation. So the dealer acquires and then dispose of these positions in a sequence of transactions. And in these uh, settings, the information environment uh, is as follows, coming from theory. So the block initiator, the one who approaches the dealer is the most informed. Uh, they have a sense for whether they're trading for liquidity or information purposes. And these models, uh, as the block trade size increases, it's more likely that they have an information motive to trade. Uh, because these negotiations are bilateral in nature, the dealer 
may partially learn about the motive for the trade. And this is uh, the trade one between the initiator and the dealer, uh, this trade here. Because he observes, the dealer observes the size of the trade, the price of the trade, the identity of the initiator, maybe some his some sense of what the urgency of the initiator is based on their bilateral conversations. And once the dealer uh, has acquired the block, the dealer then approaches other investors who we call the receiving investors to offset the block position. And because the dealer is approaching these uh, receivers, uh, the models typically talk about these receivers being potentially uh, less information motivated. Uh, they have an interest in trading. They may have an unexpressed interest, unexpressed demand to trade. And this unexpressed interest is something the dealer knows because they may be, a, for example, a relationship customer. Uh, and the dealer then approaches the uh, the receiver and uh, they enter into a bilateral negotiation and then uh, they uh, they participate in a trade. Uh, so these receivers are <clears throat> receivers who are natural counterparties to this initiator and the dealer has information on uh, who these participants might be. That's that's sort of the Grossman 1992 model of you know block trading and why a block dealer can add value. So in the theoretical models, um, there are interesting predictions regarding uh, how the information environment affects the receivers. For example, uh, it's uh, difficult for receivers to fully anticipate the information effects because they are approached by the dealer, but they do not know uh, whether there is a block trade behind that dealer. And if there is a block trade, you know what is the size of the trade, who the identity is. So. Uh, they are not able to fully anticipate the information effects. They may have some, with some probability, they may assume that there is some uh, informed trading going on, but they cannot fully anticipate it. The receiver outcomes are sensitive to the trading environment. For example, the back at all paper talks about how transparency and uh, whether the block trade is reported can affect the uh, information that gets revealed to the uh, receiving investor in their negotiations with the dealer. Uh, and there are also predictions about, you know, why do these receivers participate? If it is the case that they are the least informed participant in this uh, in this block trading process, then what is the block market's appeal for these receiving investors? So there are some very interesting uh, testable predictions that have been around for the last 20, 30 years coming out of these theoretical models. But the problem is that uh, in the trading data, uh, it's uh, you know possible to sort of identify what may be a block trade because this is the this is a large trade which is the way in which it's been sort of looked at in the literature, but it's uh, you know more difficult and in some cases in some trading data it's not possible at all to identify the trades where the dealer is involved in where they are distributing the block position uh, to the receiving investors. So um, as a sort of a quick discussion of some of the related literature. Uh, in the equity market, you have the upstairs market literature or the block trades literature uh, going back many, many years, uh, where because you can identify the block trade between the initiator and the uh, and the intermediary, uh, there's a focus on the benefits to the initiator and the role of the uh, block, read, block dealer in the upstairs trading process. Uh, in the literature, there are many, many papers which have looked at, for example, FINRA's trace data, uh, to look at uh, transactions which are large. Uh, and uh, in these uh, uh, studies, we have uh, learned more about what are the determinants of trading costs? How does uh, trade reporting affect outcomes for these participants and dealers? Uh, how does uh, you know the role of dealer networks, the role of relationships where uh, traders, uh, customers who have relationships with dealers can obtain better terms, et cetera. So, there is there is a literature which have looked at large trades. However, the challenge has been to identify a sequence of related trades such that you can identify the initiating uh, customer versus the receiving participants uh, to test specific theoretical predictions on how uh, different types of environments affect the receivers and therefore the block trading process. So in this study, we are you know, making an attempt at trying to test some of these uh, testable predictions. So we use FINRA's trace data, which as you know, reports the dealer IDs. And so with the dealer ID, we have the entire history of the dealer's trades uh, with their counterparties. And so we first identify the initiating block trade, which happens in a particular bond on a particular day. 
intermediated by a dealer and we have sort of the size of the block and we have many definitions of what this uh, block trade is. And then we identify, we follow the same dealer uh, in the trace data and identify the subsequent offsetting trades of the block dealer. And these are the trades that we identify as being the receiving investor trades. And with these receiving investor trades, then we come back and uh, we try to test some of these uh, theoretical predictions uh, that come from uh, that comes from the theoretical literature. So, in terms of our contribution, um, uh, one of our contribution is just methodological because we are coming up with a way to identify these receiver trades. And in our appendix, we describe sort of many scenarios of how do you identify these receiving investor trades and how you know the decisions we made on how we think you know we can put together this sequence of related transactions. And then uh, we test model predictions on what are the benefits of the block market for receivers and how the information of environment affects the uh, block participants. So that's that's what this paper is about. So uh, we, in order to test these testable predictions, we start with the uh, way in which price effects are calculated and decomposed in the uh, block trading literature, going back to the fantastic paper by Cross and Stoll in 1972. So we have a block trade that happens uh, at price PB. We have a pre-trade benchmark, uh, which we call here P minus seven. And the difference between the block trade and the pre-trade benchmark is the uh, cost to the initiator. This is the markup or the markdown uh, for the block initiator. And this is similar to the effective spreads that we are all familiar with. The transaction price less a pre-trade benchmark for a buyer initiator trade. Then once you have the block trade, you can identify a post trade benchmark price. And uh, the difference between the post trade benchmark price and the pre trade benchmark price is a measure of the price impact. And the remaining component is what we call the temporary price impact, which is the uh, equivalent of a realized spread. So the total uh, initiator cost can be broken down into a temporary price impact and a permanent price impact, the permanent price impact being the information content of the trade. So this is uh, this is going back to cross and stall. So we uh, take this methodology, but we further decompose it because here now, in addition to <clears throat> the pre-trade benchmark, the block price and the post-trade benchmark, <clears throat> excuse me, we also have information on the price at which this block dealer who has assumed this position at price PB is offsetting the block position. And so we can further decompose the temporary price effects into a component that is the dealer spread, the price at which they assume the position versus the price at which they offset the position, and the residual component, which is what we call the receiver spread, which is the price at which the receiver took on the position versus a post-trade benchmark. So um, with this uh, framework uh, of decomposing uh, these uh, price effects, we then take it on to uh, test these uh, theoretical predictions. And the theoretical predictions relate to the trading environment. So it relates to uh, the adverse selection risk in the market. So our empirical measure, uh, for example, a simple measure is simply the blocks exposed permanent price impact and how dealers versus receiving investors fare uh, when the price impact, when the, the trade is informed versus uh, it is uh, less informed. Uh, we also build on or sort of borrow from the literature showing that in the corporate bond market, it appears that sustained selling activity tends to be liquidity mo motivated, whereas sustained buying activity tends to contain information. This has been shown in other studies. In our sample, we also find that block buys are informed, whereas block sells are not. And so we look at what the uh, what the outcome is for the uh, you know the block market participants uh, based on this asymmetry. Then uh, we look at uh, the trading environment from the context of regulation, the first one being uh, just the initiation of mandatory trade reporting going, going back to uh, 2002 to 2005 period where we have events where we have events where a bond was not transparent, where there was no reporting of trades, it was opaque trading versus when uh, trading was introduced for the market. So we look at public bonds as well as June 2014 when transparency was introduced for 144 bonds. And then finally, our last setting is to study what happens when we change, then the regulation changes the maximum allowable delay 
in reporting a trade. So as you know, in the case of the corporate bond market, as well as other fixed income markets, a dealer may participate in a trade that happens at uh, 10 a.m., where they execute the trade at 10 a.m., but they have, uh, you know, right now they have about 15, they have 15 minutes to report that trade into Trace, uh, into the Trace data. And if you look at the Trace data, you have information on both the execution time of the trade, as well as the reporting timestamp of the trade. So you know what the delay is, when the trade was executed, versus when the um, when the uh, 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 trade was reported to the Trace system. And there have been a lot of regulations concerning what should be this delay, uh, what is the maximum permissible delay? So in our analysis, from, for, from the perspective of testing theoretical predictions, we take a particular block trade. There are many receiver in, receiving investor trades that are associated with a block trade. In our sample, uh, it's about four trades. And we look at trades that, the receiver trades that happen before the block is publicly reported versus after the block is publicly reported. The idea is that uh, theoretical predictions, theoretical models say that the report of a block trade publicly conveys private information of the dealer to the market. And this then helps the receiving investors obtain better trade terms in their bilateral negotiations with the dealer. And so we are trying to test this prediction coming out of, for example, the back model. And so we are looking at the outcomes for receiver trades that happened before the public reporting of a block trade versus after the public reporting of the block trade. And so this is a within block analysis that helps control for you know, some of the things that we worry about when we are trying to measure um, trade outcomes. And um, it, this, is, this analysis of reporting delay is actually you know, fairly, uh, it's been fairly in the news because uh, regulators have been kind of struggling with what to do with this reporting delay. So for example, um, in 2018, uh, the SEC and FINRA considered uh, a proposal to delay the reporting of block trades from the current 15 minutes to uh, 48 hours. So they were going to allow dealers to wait on reporting a block trade as much as two days uh, from the time in which the trade is executed. The CFTC also considered a similar proposal where they were uh, allowing potentially allowing block trades to be delayed for 48 hours. And then... Uh, Recently, uh, as you may have, have uh, seen, uh, under Chairman Gensler, uh, there is a proposal that is going through where the delay is going to be shortened from 15 minutes to one minute. And so now you're moving in the other direction where you're reducing the maximum permissible delay. And so I think regulators are sort of trying to figure out you know, what, you know, what would be a, a, a delay policy that would make sense. And so in this study, uh, what we are what we are doing is we are trying to provide a perspective that has been missing from the regulatory conversations. Much of the regulatory debate has been about how the trading delay affects the dealer, how it affects the block initiator. What is missing from this deliberations in our mind is the fact that there are there is a third participant, the receiving investor, and that receiving investor outcomes uh, are something that should be considered as well in these in these. Uh, deliberations. And so we are providing some empirical evidence related to that. And this is my last slide where I'm just summarizing um, what, what we have. So this is our sample of block trades, 205,000 block trades, uh, associated related receiver trades of 690,000. We find that dealers typically offset a block position with about three receiver trades. Dealers charge a markup on both legs of their round trip trade. The typical uh, the average trade size is about $8 million of this $8 million, indicating that these receiver trades are also institutional trades, as, as, as predicted in, uh, by the literature. When the block trade is informed, the adverse selection costs are primarily borne by receivers. It appears that dealers can anticipate this informed trading. So if they face adverse selection risk, why do receivers participate? We show that if you calculate an imputed cost for a receiver for initiating a similar size trade, the receiver is often better off participating as a counterparty to a block trade. So this helps understand the block market's appeal for receivers who are interested in either building or liquidating a large position. And then finally, with respect to regulation, we find that with trade report initiation, uh, dealer profits, that is with introducing of trace transparency, dealer profits decline, we already know that. Uh, it benefits the receiver. This is a sort of a new result that we bring into the literature. Whereas another type of customer, 
the block initiator, their outcomes are unchanged with introducing transparency in terms of their markups or transactions costs. So what we say here is that in terms of understanding the impact of transparency, the customer type matters. And then within block, we show that receivers obtain better outcomes on offsetting trades after a block trade is reported versus those before it. So to summarize, um, receivers offset a dealer's added inventory risk of a block trade. Their participation is essential for a well-functioning block market. And potentially, they play a more important role post dot frank because dealers are less willing to commit capital. And so our study provides empirical support for some of these theoretical predictions, and it shows how the trading environment affects the receiver outcome. Uh, so that's that's what this paper is about. Uh, happy to uh, take uh, any uh, questions, and uh, and then uh, in the remaining time, I would I would uh, like to show you some of the results. Thanks, Kumar. Uh, let's see if there are any questions. Yeah, I have a quick question. So what was the logic behind uh, making it 48 hours previously instead of one minute now? Yeah, so uh, the the main uh, uh, supporters of, these, uh, of this uh, greater delay uh, for reporting of block trades were the big, uh, were the dealers, the big dealers and the big buy side institutions. Uh, who were trading with the dealers. And, and the idea was that uh, they were saying that the block market uh, is uh, declining because of uh, regulation. And uh, so block trades are not getting done. And because block trades are not getting done, uh, the buy side is, uh, is, uh, is hurt. And so uh, we need to allow the dealers uh, uh, you know, a, a longer delay so that if they take on a block position, uh, they have the ability to offset the position. And so it helps manage, you know, it helps the dealers manage their risk of building a large inventory. Thanks. So that logic will still apply, right? If dealers become less profitable, maybe the market collapses for that reason. It's 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 definitely possible. So I think I think uh, 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 and uh, you know, interesting question for the regulators is if you delay, as is being currently proposed, uh, the reporting the maximum permissible time period to one minute. Uh, then will that will that hurt the block market? That's that's correct, Pankaj. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we have Anant and then Albert. Okay, yeah. Hey, Mark. Um, very interesting uh, data set. I have a question. Do you, are some of these block trades related to index funds or to ETF um, rebalancing, um, or are they just motivated by you know active players uh, in in the marketplace? Hey Anand, um, thank you. Uh, so we don't we don't uh, we don't uh, do any analysis related to that because uh, we don't have the information to actually uh, to actually identify when it may be related to a in to an to a, to uh, some kind of a portfolio rebalancing. Um, so uh, because we just observe a block trade, it's possible that those would be the more uh, liquidity motivated trades. Um, but we, we don't have any analysis specifically on that. Okay. I was, I was just going to suggest for the future, you, you can identify, uh, the major, um, indices that are, that are used in, in bond ETFs and index funds. And, you know, the, the rebalancing dates are public, uh, as are the securities that are being added and deleted. So you can cross that with your sample and see how much is, is related, uh, not for this study, of course, but maybe for the future. Thank you, Anand. Albert. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. thanks, uh, Kumar, for laying this out so clearly. It's uh, super interesting, this stuff. Uh, but you, you went a bit uh, quick through uh, all your findings, uh, and I don't think you, I heard you talk about uh, the idea that uh, if you, I understand that when the receiving end has seen the uh, the trades so post uh, post reporting, that they have more power. That's better for them. Now this might all feed back to the early stages, where uh, whoever initiates the block might have second thoughts and not initiate in these type of uh, situations. And if we think about the market quality and welfare and all that stuff. It's probably interesting to take a look at the intensity with with which uh, block trades occur. So you might you might have a, you know better 
deal for the receivers, but then it might be worse for the initiator, and then you might have left less uh, initiation of block trades or less trades. So I was wondering if you looked at that dimension and if you thought that was interesting. Albert, thank you. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, we we did look at that. So I think perhaps the you know first order effect that we might expect to see is with just the introduction of transparency, right? Because you have a bond that is opaque and then you introduce transparency and then it starts trading. So we looked at that event and we looked at, uh, for example, a block volume as a percentage of uh, total volume in that bond and how that changed. Uh, and how did it change the dealer behavior as well? I'm sorry, I didn't get in, I get a chance to get sure, you know, talk about some of those results in the summary. So uh, our first result is that at least based on initiation of trace, for example, we do not find that the block volume declines. So we do not find evidence that initiation of trace reporting results in a decline in block trading activity. Uh, and and uh, and two, uh, when we look at the uh, behavior of dealers, what we find is that with transparency, uh, tr you know, trace initiation, or uh, in our analysis where we look at uh, the delay being reduced from 75 minutes to 45 minutes uh, to 30 minutes to 15 minutes. So we have several events during the sample period. When you look at those events to see dealer behavior before versus after, what we find is that dealers are offsetting their block position at a faster rate such that before the reporting of the block trade, they're offsetting about 20% in each, each of the regimes. So in the 75 minute regime, they were offsetting about 20% of the block position that they took. Uh, when you move to a 30% uh, 30 